The early morning sun was rising over the grounds of Klingelpitz prison in Cologne, Germany, as a man named Peter Curtin entered the execution courtyard on July 2, 1931. Just shy of 50 years old, he was of average height with neatly combed dark hair and one of those faces that could resemble anyone. In fact, if you looked hard enough, he almost resembled a far more famous German citizen whose rise to fame just a few months later would vastly overshadow this man's crimes, effectively hiding him from the pages of history. Flanked by the prison's priest and psychiatrist, he was on his way to the guillotine to answer for the heinous crimes he had committed over the past 17 years. Welcome or welcome back to True Stories, join our family in exploring some of the most twisted true crime cases. As always, don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Now, let's get into it. Known as the Vampire of Dusseldorf and the Dusseldorf Monster, Peter Curtin spent almost 20 years fulfilling his deepest darkest desires. As a child, he'd been subjected to abuse, beaten by his alcoholic parents, and forced to watch them copulate. Before he even entered his teens he had attempted to drown one of his playmates and had befriended a local dog catcher who taught him how to torture and kill the animals he caught. At the age of 13, Curtin formed a relationship with a girl his age, though she resisted, having sexual intercourse with him. To channel his sexual frustrations, Curtin resorted to bestiality. In the next few years, Curtin stole all of the money in his household and ran away from home to begin a relationship with a prostitute two years his senior. He would then spend a month in jail for petty theft and four years in prison for fraud. In 1904, Curtin was drafted into the German army, though he soon deserted. He began committing acts of arson, watching from a distance as emergency teams arrived on the scene. Eventually, he was arrested for arson, was discovered to be a deserter, and tried by the military system. During his imprisonment, his third so far, he claimed he encountered severe forms of punishment and developed deranged erotic fantasies. Finally, in 1913, he was released from prison and moved to Mulheim am Rhein. Though his crimes before were awful, the worst was yet to come. While inside the home, he happened upon the homeowner's nine-year-old daughter. Overcome by the erotic fantasies he had thought up in prison, he strangled her and slashed her throat with his pocket knife. The next day, he returned to the scene by visiting a tavern across the street. Hearing the locals talk about his crimes was something of a high for him, and he reveled in hearing their reactions. Over the next few months, again overwhelmed by the need to see the effects of his crime, he would visit the girl's grave and touch the soil under which she was buried for sexual satisfaction. Two months after killing the young girl, Peter Curtin committed the same crime, this time burglarizing the home of a 17-year-old girl. As he had before. Though he intended to continue his spree, he was, fortunately, arrested for arson and burglary later that year. He spent eight years in a military prison in Brieg, Germany, before being released in April of 1921. Upon his release from his fourth period of incarceration, Curtin became engaged to a woman named August Scharf, a shop owner and former prostitute. It was also a perfect match, as August had previously been accused of fatally shooting her former fiancé, whom Curtin had previously posed, as to evade arrest. However, the union was hardly a happy one due to Curtin's increasing infidelities. Upon realizing that her husband had been sleeping with not one, but two of their maids, she encouraged one of them to press charges, claiming Curtin had forced her into it. The charge held up in court, and Curtin was sentenced to his fifth prison sentence, this time for six months. After his release, Curtin, of course, picked up his old habits. Over the course of one month, he murdered two people and attempted to murder a third, though she survived her injuries. Peter Curtin's preferred method of torture and murder was stabbing, usually with a pair of sharpened scissors. In addition to physical mutilation, he would sexually abuse his victims and strangle them into unconsciousness. He also occasionally returned to the crime scenes to discuss his crimes with police under the guise of a concerned citizen. Over the next several months he attempted to strangle four women, but each of them got away from him. Then, in August of 1929, his killing spree reached an all-time high. Over the course of the month, he murdered six people. The first was a woman he had stalked for almost a week, whose body he wished to crucify on a decomposing tree in order to cause a scene for the public. Eventually, he settled for burying her, though he did follow up the murder with a detailed letter to police, including a map to her body. After writing the letter, in an attempt to throw police off his trail, he switched from his signature pair of scissors to a knife. Additionally, he randomly stabbed three people. An 18-year-old girl, a 30-year-old man, and a 37-year-old woman 
who all escaped but described their attacker differently, effectively confusing police. Three days after the random stabbings, Peter Curtin murdered a pair of sisters. The next month, Curtin murdered two servant girls, this time using a hammer to strike them over the heads. He also stabbed a child, leaving her for dead in an alleyway, in what would be his final murder. On May 14, Curtin attempted to seduce and murder a 20-year-old woman named Maria Budlick. She made it as far as his apartment before realizing his intentions and fleeing the scene. However, she didn't report her ordeal to the police, instead detailing the event in a letter to a friend. As luck would have it, she incorrectly addressed the letter, and it ended up in the hands of a postal worker, who thankfully passed it on to police. At the same time that the police were reading Budlick's letter, Curtin was confessing his crimes to his wife. Incredibly, she had managed to stay married to him and apparently remained completely unaware of his crimes. As Curtin knew there was a reward out for him, he suggested that his wife be the one to turn him in. That way, there would be money left for her after his imminent incarceration. As soon as he was arrested, Peter Curtin folded and immediately confessed to the crimes while expressing no remorse. he ended up admitting to 68 crimes, including 10 murders and 31 attempted. He justified the crimes, claiming that they were revenge for the horrors that life had inflicted upon him during childhood and that he was simply claiming what was due to him. Horrified by his confession, police ordered a psychological evaluation, the first ever performed on a sexual serial killer. However, the findings would horrify them even more. Despite his colorful and detailed confession, his admittance of multiple erotic psychosexual fantasies involving blood, mass murder, and fire, five separate psychologists concluded that he was, in fact, perfectly sane and fit to stand trial. Peter Curtin's lack of remorse only presented itself further when a judge asked him about his conscience, questioning if the man felt he had one at all. I have none he responded. Never have I felt any misgiving in my soul, never did I think to myself that what I did was bad, even though human society condemns it. My blood and the blood of my victims must be on the heads of my torturers. The punishments I have suffered have destroyed all my feelings as a human being. That was why I had no pity for my victims. For 10 days the prosecution and the defense argued about Cutchin's motives, his crimes, his conscience, and his punishment before the jury ultimately reached a guilty verdict. He was found guilty of murder and given nine death sentences to be carried out by guillotine. Upon laying his head down on the machine, he turned to the psychiatrist and asked a question. Tell me he asked. After my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. The executioner then dropped the blade. Following his death, Peter Curtin's head was removed for forensic analysis and eventually found its way to the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in Wisconsin. Doctors were sure that something must have been wrong with him for him to have been so passive regarding his crimes. Shockingly, the exam revealed nothing abnormal about him. Peter Curtin was simply a deranged serial killer, plagued with erotic visions of death, seeking retribution for a childhood lost. We've come to the end, thank you for watching. Don't forget to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe. Till next time.